So we've had kind of official cyber strategies for the last decade or so. So I'm gonna kind of walk you guys through our brief history of cyber strategy and hopefully bring you to today where we can discuss kind of what, what should the Biden administration be thinking about as they start to develop their own cyber strategy. So the first cyber strategies really kind of started coming out in the mid 2000s to early, to early like 2010s. Now, this is kind of my foundational adulthood. Um, and these were good years, y'all. Like these were the digital golden years. We, we really saw a lot of hope and promise with the digital technologies that were propagating not only kind of the, the technology that was booming at that time, but also we started seeing uh, digital technologies being used to get good governance. So this is the, these are the years of the Arab Spring. I mean, this was in, the Arab Spring was a real pivotal moment, especially for the Obama administration as they thought about the, the role of cyber and digital technologies within their overarching strategies. They looked at what was happening in the Arab countries and the use of social media to spread democratic governance and uh, social uprisings. And they were like, this is great. Like, more information equals good. You know, it was, it was, there was a relationship. And I think there's, I pulled out a quote here that comes from the International Strategy for Cyberspace, which came out in 2011. This is the first kind of official cyberspace strategy. And this comes out early in the Obama administration. And I'm going to read this to you guys because I think it's really important to take in comparison to where we are today. The digital world is no longer a lawless frontier nor the province of a small elite. It is a place where the norms of responsible, just, and peaceful conduct among states and people have begun to take hold. It just went, they were so excited. <laughs> And it just wasn't what happened. Um, now, at the same time that they're really excited and really optimistic and hopeful about digital, the digital world, they're investing in, uh, in capabilities. So the same time period that we're seeing this kind of strategy, you see that the Obama administration is focusing on international norms. You see that discussion of norms there. That's a picture of the GGE, which is the UN um, experts that study cybersecurity, and they started meeting and discussing kind of what was appropriate behaviors in cyberspace. And at the time, the Obama administration is really, really confident that they're going to be able to influence this international discussion about what was appropriate and not appropriate in cyberspace. Now, at the same time, they are, however, standing up some kind of militarized cyber capabilities. So we see in 2011 that the United States stands up its first um, military Cyber Command. That's Cyber Command. At the time, it started under Strategic Command. This is a big deal for the United States. This is a big, important choice for the United States. Because Strategic Command is typically about nuclear weapons. So we're thinking about big strategic weaponry. And then we stick cyber underneath it. So cyber, under uh, General Alexander, is on this paper, really becomes a discussion about deterrence and strategic concepts. Um, so like we just spent the first you know, five minutes talking a lot about ransomware and these little attacks. That was not what they were thinking. They were really thinking that the big impact of cyber was going to be in these very, very large scale strategic attacks. OK, but then like, reality set in. So now let's move to the second half of the Obama administration. And we have what I would call a sobering cyber reality. It's sobering because of what's happening externally, but it's sobering because the Obama administration realizes that it's actually just a pain in the butt trying to figure out how to deal with these issues. So I think maybe one of the most pivotal things that happens, and this is kind of a giant shift for the Obama administration, is the North Korean attack on Sony. I don't know if any of you guys saw that movie, The Interview. It wasn't great. <laughs> the only reason like, we remember it is because the North Koreans got so angry. And they ended up launching an attack through this um, group they called the Lazarus Group um, that attacked the Sony company and took money away from the Sony company. But most importantly, it really took down almost the entire Sony infrastructure within the United States. And the Obama administration starts meeting to discuss, well, what do we do about this? And they've, remember, they've spent the last few years like, excited about the digital world, focusing on norms and diplomacy, and, and thinking about deterrence. And they realize, we have nothing to do to deal with this. We have no military option to deal with this. We have very limited kind of foreign policy options to deal with this. And so they start realizing we have a problem. Deterrence might not be able to work against all these things. And norms 
are not working either because they're not spreading um, consistently. At the same time, Iran is increasing their attacks on both financial institutions and dams. This is an example, uh, a picture of the dam that they uh, attacked in, in uh, I think it was New York. Uh, it made all the front pages of the, and headlines, and then somebody looked at it and was like, this is not a really important dam. But you know, the, Iranians are <laughs> the Iranians are experimenting here, and they're becoming more and more active, and we're not really doing anything about it at this point. Um, at the same time, you have the Chinese large-scale hack of the Office of Personnel Management. Some of you, like me, still get identity force for free because I got my <laughs> identity stolen in this giant hack. But I mean, we're seeing at the end of the Obama administration that things just aren't working. The Chinese are taking tons and tons of data. Um, they're doing some of it for espionage, and they're doing a lot of it for economic theft. Um, and then at the end of the Obama administration, we have the hack and reveal of the DNC um, combined with an information operations conducted by the Russian Information um, Research Agency, IRA. So end of the Obama administration, they're like, oh, shoot. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a hopeful uh, world. We thought we could rely on deterrence and norms. This isn't working. So um, in this process, they've spent the last six years trying to build out lanes in the road. Remember I talked at the beginning that one of the key elements of strategy is delegating who does what in the, in, in the big federal government. And this, you guys, what you're looking at is the this is the only document that came out of the Obama administration that delineated who does what in the US government. This went through over 500 iterations. I don't think it was ever officially published anywhere. So y'all are, I mean, y'all are seeing some insider gossip here. Um, but what it did is it, this laid out who did what in the US government. And so if you look, who is the lead for protection? DHS. So the Obama administration takes an, an organization that, that's really new, it's kind of still figuring out what it's supposed to be doing. And it puts DHS in charge of almost everything when it comes to cyber. But DHS doesn't have the capability or the authorities to launch attacks. So DOD, as the lead for national defense, is the only organizational bubble there that's allowed to, to actually conduct offensive cyber attacks. Now, under the Obama administration, the authority to conduct those offensive cyber operations. Remember I, I said in, before that that like strat, cybercom falling under stratcom was really important? Well, they decided that offensive cyber was kind of almost the same level as nuclear, and so they really consolidated and centralized approval for offensive cyber operations. And so almost every single cyber attack coming from the United States had to go all the way up to the president in order to be approved. So this meant that the DOD bubble, that lead for national defense, was actually like pretty small. So when Sony happens, and they get everyone in a room, and they say, what do we do now about Sony? The DOD is like, well, you told us we couldn't do anything, so we haven't prepped anything, so we don't, we don't have anything to do. So the DOD at this point is kind of churning. They want to do more, but they can't really do more, just based on the, the way legislative authorities and executive um, authorities have been set up. And then you see DOJ, FBI. Um, we don't talk about DOJ, FBI enough, but they actually play a really, really, really large role when it comes to the lanes of the road in US cyber strategy, because all that criminal activity actually falls under DOJ. And so you started seeing in the Obama administration, they're not really using the DOD, but they start using the State Department and they start using Treasury to think about sanctions. So how can we use sanctions to try and change behavior in cyberspace? And then using DOJ and FBI, um, you start seeing warrants um, for criminal actors. And sometimes these criminal actors are actual state-based actors. So in the case of China, you saw a series of indictments uh, for Chinese, um, I think actually PLA, uh, the People's Liberation Army members, who were conducting basically economic espionage and intellectual property theft. And so DOJ and FBI, you know, they, they put out indictments. And so this is kind of part and parcel of the Obama strategy to use other means of national power to try and change behavior within the, the Chinese um, at the end of their um, at the end of their administration, they're really focused on the Chinese. So yeah, that was, um, that, was, that was what we used to figure out who did what when big crises occurred.
It's called the bubble chart, by the way. If you're ever in DC and, and somebody is like talking about how long they've been in cyber, you'd be like, yeah, but did you work with the bubble chart? And then get a little street cred. <laughs> OK, all right. So that brings us into the Trump administration. And I'm going to call this period Cyber Unleashed because the Trump administration actually changed a lot of the regulations and authorities that had previously kind of um, focused or, or restrained at least Department of Defense cyber operations. So um, I said before that the Department of Defense was not allowed to conduct cyber operations unless the president approved. This gets changed under the Trump administration. So they delegate responsibility to a lower level. At the same time, the Cyber Command, which had previously been under Strategic Command, so like nuclear weapons and stuff, gets elevated. I know this sounds wonky and boring, but this becomes a big deal. Because once they become elevated, they're their own command. So they no longer have to ask Strategic Command, hey, can I do this? Can I do that? And they get to start branding their own identity. So this becomes a really, really big transition. They start developing their own strategy. Um, they actually lead in strategy development and actually end up leading um, what happens in the Trump administration. So if you remember nothing else, here's how I would summarize the Trump administration's four years of cyber. They gave a lot of responsibility and authorities back to organizations, DOD and the new DHS um, CISA, which dealt with critical infrastructure. Really charismatic leaders of these organizations. So you've got General Nakasone at Cyber Command. You have, um, oh my gosh, how is my Krebs, Chris Krebs at CISA. And these are really charismatic individuals. They're very competent. And you actually get tons of experimentation that starts occurring within these organizations. Meanwhile, the Trump administration had like kind of a revolving door of cyber uh, experts and cyber leaders within the NSC. So they, they kind of stopped watching. <laughs> um, and so you got a bit of like a strategic um, I wouldn't say strategic avoidance, but they just stopped caring about cyber as much. And so you actually ended up getting a lot of bottom-up experimentation. But what you also happened was that not all the things were working together. And let me show you kind of how, what that looked like. OK. So I mentioned under the Obama administration, the focus was on deterrence and a be prepared posture. So the focus was on norms. How do we develop norms so that states restrain themselves on their own? Now, they limited authorities for cyber operations, and they were super, super concerned about escalation. So they really talked a lot. I mean, if you go through their strategy, the 2015 strategy, it's like concerns about escalation, escalation, escalation. So the, the idea was let's do less in cyber so that we don't open the Pandora's box of what might happen. Trump administration's much more risk is accepted in cyberspace. And they have a series of strategies that come out. Now, strategies, when done correctly, should start at the top and come down. That's not what happened. So what happened here was, remember I told you Cyber Command stood up as its own command. It wrote itself a strategy. That strategy came out before the defense strategy. So then the defense strategy came out, and then the NSC. And none of these things were like super connected. Um, so they, they weren't all telling each other to do the same thing. But the idea behind at least the DOD strategy and the Cyber Command strategy was to lean forward. And they, and they were going to escalate in order to mitigate escalation risks. So they call this persistent engagement. Other places you'll see defend forward. It's a wonky difference if you guys are really interested. But what, what they're saying is, we are not going to wait until the bad guys come and attack our networks. We are going to go out to them. So the idea was that you were going to defend forward by going into the adversary's networks and attacking their, the IRA, the Russian IRA's ability to uh, get on their own internet. Um, and so the idea was to be more aggressive and more assertive. But nobody really knew what this meant. To be fair, the people implementing weren't quite sure what this meant. And publicly, people were very confused about how far forward Defend Forward really was. So it turned into a bit of a confusion. So we started getting kind of conflicting statements coming from Cyber Command, the DOD, the NSC. Like I said, there was a bit of a revolving door. And so we got a little bit of strategic confusion about what everything was supposed to be. Um, so in 2019, the New York Times says, hey, the US is actually launching malware attacks into Russia's electric power grid. And this kind of, uh, this starts, we say, really? Is the US doing this? Is this what Defend For It is? And so you start hearing um, a lot of debate occurring between 
the Department of Defense, the NSC, like are we actually doing this? Is this how far we're going? A lot of questions about kind of how far are we actually defending forward. And this turned into what I call a two threshold problem. So in the new kind of Trump strategy, we had two thresholds that the US needed to maintain. A threshold that happened every day that we would call the defend forward cyber threshold. And this threshold was supposed to be kind of everyday tit for tat engagement. And the US was supposed to be able to engage with its adversaries in cyberspace, but not escalate to violence. And so this is kind of the point of the defense strategy and cyber command strategy. But at the same time, there was this kind of strategic cyber attack threshold where the US said, yeah, yeah, this, this, some of this cyber stuff can happen, but some of this cyber stuff is not okay. And so the US was having trouble articulating kind of what cyber stuff was okay and what cyber stuff was not okay, both for what adversaries did to us and also for what the United States felt like it was appropriate for it to do. And so this, was, this caused a lot of confusion, um, continues to cause confusion. And now we're looking into the Biden administration. So we've got 10 years of cyber strategy here. And we have a big shift from the digital optimism that started the early 2000s to today's strategies where we've seen a lot more experimentation, we've seen a lot more evolution, we've also seen uh, the rise of the cyber threats. So the Biden administration needs to think like, what do I keep from these previous strategies and what do we start all over again? And are we even thinking of cyber in the appropriate way? All right, so this is, uh, this is what I briefed to them, <laughs> how I said they should put their cyber uh, strategy together. So the key with strategy is to think about lines of effort and how lines of effort work together within the strategy. So the US needs to do a lot of things in cyber. It needs to make sure that our companies can operate without worrying that they're going to lose tons of resources or that they're going to be extremely vulnerable. But we also need to have strategic deterrence against cyber big strategic attacks on critical infrastructure. We need cyber that supports conventional campaigns, and we have to be able to respond to cyber crises while also having resiliency and defense. So the key, as we move into the, uh, the Biden administration, is to think about how all these things to go together and who should be doing what. And I think kind of one of the enduring questions at this point is, Every single one of the strategies so far has really placed a premium on an open and free internet. There was an underlying assumption that for the United States, the biggest prosperity was in having digital openness. And that digital openness would lead to um, a more productive society um, and better governance. But that's really come under question over the last 10 years. And so the, the Biden administration is going to need to think about do we focus on an open internet or do we focus instead on securing the internet? And that creates a very different kind of internet structure, a very different governance structure. Uh, for what it's worth, the Chinese and the Russians believe more in the um, closed structure. It allows them to control their populations better. Yeah.